Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. We're sitting down with Matt Geiger, fund manager of MJG Capital Fund. And we're in Belize at the end of our Palisade Hard Asset Investor Conference, which we threw with our great partner, David Zook. And Matt gave a talk uh, earlier today, actually, and he put some parameters down on what he looks for in terms of investment, both on exploration and development stage companies. Matt, let me start by asking, before we get into that, we're obviously uh, a year into a great market, and uh, what do you think is going to happen for the rest of 2017 here? Thank you, Colin. It's, uh, it's been amazing being down here with, with the group. Um, a lot of smart, smart minds down here, both on the real estate side and the hard asset side. So it's been, it's been a really great few days. Thank you for putting it, putting it together. Um, 2017, I think, is going to be a very, very lucrative year um, for participants in this space. Uh, we've, in essence, seen, in my opinion, the bottoming of uh, a really ugly bear market in early 2016. And we're about one year into a broad-based bull market. Uh, it was led by the precious metals. Uh, 2016 in particular, uh, up through August, was a really, really uh, special time for investors in that place. Uh, people that were able to get involved in Q4 or even Q1 of 2016. Um, base metals picked up the slack as precious metals in August uh, of 2016 had a bit of a pullback that lasted through December. Um, they continue to remain strong. Uh, zinc in particular is, is a metal to look at, which just over the past you know, 14, 15 months has moved from 80 cents all the way above a buck 30. So really sensational moves. Um, recently, uh, you know, one of the focuses of this conference was uranium. Um, we saw bottoming uh, in the uranium space in early December. Um, Palisade guys did an amazing job calling that. Um, and I think we're about 60 to 90 days into this new uranium bull market that's probably going to last for three to four years, probably similar to the last one that we saw. So a lot of opportunity in this space. We're seeing energy metals pick up the slack as well. You know, cobalt, manganese, vanadium, really across the board, there's a broad-based move. Um, the only area that I'm really interested in right now that I haven't seen move yet are the ag minerals. So this would be potash, phosphates, nitrogen. Um, I'm particularly uh, partial to phosphate. Um, I, I really like that story. If you look in the abundance in the Earth's crust, uh, phosphate's about one-tenth as, as common as potash. Uh, they're both key ingredients in inorganic fertilizer. Uh, this is a pretty brain-dead play to me. Uh, this is, you know, banking on global population continuing to grow, uh, banking on per capita uh, consumption of meats continuing to grow, and it's, it's a pretty rare opportunity to be able to buy um, in these, in these uh, you know, dips, basically. Palisade's been a major proponent of investing in private placements, and you have, of course, as well. I enjoy having conversations with you about how the market's uh, reacting, even on a, a, a kind of small level. And what I, what I mean by saying that is the venture exchange, the HUI, they're not really up that much the last couple of months. But oddly enough, uh, your portfolio and the portfolio for Palisade, the discretionary sort of capital, is up uh, an astounding amount in just the first 45 days of the year. And I don't know if that's to be attributed to the torque that we're starting to get out of the warrants in there, or is it showing uh, just the absolute strength that's starting to come into these juniors, and they're, gonna, they're really going to start to outperform in the next leg of this bull market? Well, it's a little bit of both, Colin. Uh, ultimately, I think the junior space is going to do phenomenally well. Um, 2017, 2018, into 2019, I can say confidently, uh, whether this bull market continues beyond that remains to be seen. Um, but if you have an opportunity to participate in private placements, this is the way to really get a leg up on the competition and really compound returns. Um, when I reported performance at the end of this year, we were up 95% without including warrants. Uh, the reason that I didn't include warrants is that none of the warrants were in the money, as simple as a year ago. Um, now that has completely changed, and going forward, we're, we're going to continue uh, to, we're going to start counting that value when reporting portfolio performance. And I was looking at the numbers, and we're up almost double if you factor in the, the warrants that are in the money right now using intrinsic value. So right there, making the same picks, but, but being disciplined and participating in smart placements, uh, there's no guarantees that it's going to double your performance, but you can really, really sweeten your returns. Um, and there's no reason for me uh, as an investor to ever buy common shares in a company that needs to come back to market in the next six months, in the next nine months. Uh, I really like to stay uh, disciplined on this, sit on my hands. Uh, when the company comes to market with a placement, I'll evaluate it then. 
uh, evaluate the terms, uh, make sure to look for a full warrant, hopefully two years or more to expiry, um, hopefully no accelerator, uh, possibly a discount to market. Uh, these are the things I look at. And uh, if you look at the past six, uh, seven positions that we've initiated, they've all been through private placement. So I'm not averse to buying common shares by any means, but when you have the opportunity to get these warrant sweeteners, um, you know, to me, it's, it's really brain dead and I don't understand why more investors aren't interested in this. So Matt, you just mentioned the fact that you started to value the warrants in your portfolio for the fund. And I think that that's based on the intrinsic value of the warrants being in the money. As an example, if the warrants are at 10 cents and the stock's trading at 20, then that implies a value of 10 cents per warrant. Uh, now, there's a way of running a Black-Scholes model, but that doesn't really work that well for some companies in the junior space because Black-Scholes requires uh, to have the, the volume or the movement of money in the stock, and it's, it doesn't always properly reflect what the warrants are worth. One thing that I saw and uh, started looking at a couple months ago, see, there's these tradable warrants like JDL.WT or PilotGoldPLG.WT, and uh, for example, JDL's warrants, which are four years out, are now trading at... 60 cents, even though the stock's in a buck 80 and the warrant strike price is at $3. I think that's really interesting to look at because not all warrants are tradable, but we can say with certainty that those warrants are valued very highly just based on looking at the ones that are tradable. Have you given any thoughts on that, Matt? Absolutely. Well, you can value the out of the money warrants using the Black Scholes model. However, one of the big issues in this space is you know the lack of liquidity, and you can get some really weird outcomes using that formula. Just out of conservatism, if the warrants aren't in the money, I value them at zero. And then if they are in the money, I value them using the intrinsic value, which is current market price minus strike price. I think that's the right way to go uh, if you're going to be reporting performance to partners or looking at your overall portfolio and checking performance since the start of this bull market. Um, ultimately, there are quite a few of these examples. You brought up JDL. Uh, Energy Fuels is another one where we saw the warrants trading at a substantial value even though they weren't yet in the money. Again, I'd rather be conservative uh, if they're not over the strike price, just count them as zero. And then when they, when they go over, um, use, use intrinsic value in order to value your portfolio. Great. Matt, your portfolio is made up of a mixture of exploration stage projects, those projects that uh, companies, I should say, that are looking to develop an asset, a resource, something that might go into production. Then you've also got development stage projects, something that already have a resource and are maybe talking about or moving towards production. Let's start with exploration. Maybe just touch on a couple of the key points that you're looking for there uh, when trying to decide if, if it's worthy of investing in the company. Well, management is key, um, regardless of the stage of company, all the way up through a producer. However, I do have a strong belief that the earlier stage the company is, the closer it is to exploration, the more important management is, the more important that IP is. And you really have to find people that have done it before. Um, you know, mineral exploration is an extremely uh, risky, risky endeavor. Um, out of every thousand mineral occurrences that are found, uh, maybe one will ultimately become an economic mine. And out of every 3,000 mineral occurrences that are found, maybe one will become a world-class mine. So the odds are very long. That said, there seems to be a disproportionate amount of discoveries made by a small group of people. And as an investor, if you want to be involved in the exploration space, it's your job to seek out those people, build a relationship with them, and be there when the timing's right in order to get involved either in placements or when the stock is, is not fairly valued in your mind. Uh, I, I like to divide exploration uh, plays into kind of two buckets. Uh, the first is the single story project. Uh, this is definitely the riskier way to go. Um, it's not my preferred method. However, uh, there are certain management teams that really, really have, have done it before and have a strong conviction um, that a certain project uh, will work. And these companies will raise money, will drill the project, uh, hopefully they'll find something uh, or they're gonna get seriously diluted. Um, but you, you, you can make pretty phenomenal returns uh, if the company hits pay dirt, uh, if the company is able to find something worth developing and then advance it uh, through the through the expiration cycle and into development. Uh, however, I'm pretty impartial uh, to the prospect generator model. Um, I think that's the right way to approach expiration. Um, there's really three different metrics I look at for these prospect generators. Um, the first is uh, synthetic revenue relative to the company's uh, enterprise value. When I say synthetic revenue, uh, that refers to the amount of money that seniors are spending on behalf of these prospect generators over the next year. Um, obviously, the higher that ratio is of synthetic revenue to enterprise value, the more attractive the opportunity, because here's, here's larger companies spending money on your behalf in order to advance your projects. 
Sure, something economic is found, you're only going to be able to keep 20 to 30 percent of it at the end of the day, but tremendous value can be created through mineral exploration, and that 20, 30 percent can be well, well worth your time in order to avoid dilution. Uh, the second key is uh, runway. Again, mineral exploration, if you've diluted the company too much over the course, uh, you're not going to be able to make returns as a shareholder. Uh, runway is a concept of looking at the company's working capital divided by their all-in monthly burn and getting a rough idea of, you know, in a worst case scenario, how far can this company go um, without raising money. And, and then the final uh, key I'll look at is working capital relative to enterprise value. Uh, this is more of a measure of downside risk. This is particularly important in bear markets if you're trying to uh, speculate in some early stage plays because you know we, we have seen in the past that when things get ugly, companies can get really close to, to trading up the value of their working capital. However, I view that as pretty much a floor and as long as management is, is genuine and they're, they're relatively good stewards of capital. There's no reason why a company should be trading below their working capital value. So I'll generally look at these three metrics when evaluating prospect generators in the exploration stage. Same exact question for you, but now on development stage companies. As far as development plays go, uh, this again is an oversimplification, but I do like to divide it into two different buckets. Uh, the first are the top tier companies, uh, the deposits that are going to be in the, at the end of the day, the bottom quartile of all in production costs. And in order to get excited about a company like that, there's generally three different things I like to see. Um, this, of course, when I say development stage company, I usually want to see a PEA in order to, at least, in order to, to look at these. So the first is you want NPV to be greater than initial capex. Uh, person, personally, I use a 10% discount rate after tax. Uh, those exact numbers are a little bit arbitrary, but I think it's important to standardize it across all of, your, all of the companies that you're evaluating. Um, you want to view this from a senior perspective, and if the company's MPV is below initial capex, it makes no sense at current commodity prices in order to put that project into production. So you really want to see that. Uh, the second is an IRR over 25%. Um, mineral exploration is, and, and development is a very risky enterprise. And you want to make sure that if you get things right, that you're going to be amply rewarded. 25% uh, or even over 30% um, is, is worth it in my eyes. And then the third is payback. Uh, if you're a senior and you're about to put up initial capex into a project, you want to be able to recoup that capital quickly so then you can put it into uh, additional projects elsewhere. I like to see a payback within three years. Uh, relatively arbitrary, but you, you do see that the high quality projects will generally recoup all investment within that time period and the rest is, is pure cash flow from there. Um, the second bucket is, is optionality plays. Um, these, are, these are deposits that may be very large, uh, may be uh, lower grade, and, and, and do require a higher commodity price in order to work. Uh, these are much riskier plays, uh, because if you're wrong you know, on your thesis on where a commodity is going, you can get really burned. By the same token, if you do have a very, very strong conviction that a certain commodity is going to move upwards in price, you can get the most leverage in the highest terms on these higher projects. So paradoxically, um, the higher cost producers, um, and if you look at development stage companies, the lower grade, larger deposits are the ones that disproportionately see the, the largest increase in value uh, during a rising price environment, when that underlying metal is rising in price. So more risky, uh, really depends on the investor and their, their thesis on an individual commodity. Um, right now, the, the commodity I'm most willing to engage in this optionality um, angle is uranium. Um, I think the price is brain dead low right now. When we were at $18, uh, absurdly, not a single producer in the world is making money, and that's just simply not sustainable. So I think the price of uranium has to rise. Uh, I think you know decent projects that do need a higher uranium price but have the right management advancing them uh, can do sensationally well. And if you're very convinced that this is a space to be in over the next two to three years, you may want to look towards the lower grade development projects. You may want to look towards the higher cost producers. Uh, if you're right on that thesis, you will see higher returns um, than, the, than the higher quality projects. So pretty paradoxical. Um, in our portfolio, I like to do a mix of, of both. Um, you don't want to be too overexposed. But at the same token, if you really believe that the price of a commodity has to go up, uh, why, not, why not increase your leverage a little bit? As you said before, Matt, this conference was quite a, quite a bit of focus on uranium. The uranium sector has been very hot for the last couple months. And a company that you brought up during your talk was 
uh, Appia Energy. Appia is a company we're very large shareholders of. All of our listeners know that, and it's it's seen quite a bit of price appreciation just in the last couple of weeks here, but. It's still relatively cheap. Anyway, I want to ask you, uh, first of all, interest, interestingly enough, Appia is, in theory, both a development and exploration stage uh, company, so it fits in both sides of your portfolio. I think you're more focused on uh, the exploration side, but tell us what you think about Appia. Appia is a great story. Uh, very, very few people know about the story. It trades on the CSE currently. Um, pretty low volumes until recently, and I, I think we're going to see a massive run run in that stock in particular. Uh, they do have four properties, but I view this as a single story uh, exploration play. Um, they're drilling their Loringer property in the eastern Athabasca Basin right now. Um, I'm excited to see results in the next two to three months. I think that could be a major, major catalyst for shares if they're able to, to find a, a near surface uh, high grade uh, hold or two. And we'll just have to see how that pans out. You know, This is an example of a company that could have a major come in, a Denison or a Cameco, to spend money on their property, but they are so convinced that there's something at Loringer. Uh, this is James Sykes, of course, is the, the head geo there. He's making the calls uh, as far as as far as far uh, Loringer, and he is very confident that he's gonna make his third major uranium discovery in the basin. Um, you know, in this case, why let a senior come in and, and dilute uh, your share of the project if, if, you're, if you're that convinced? So this is one area where, you know, I'm not worried about about management going in on their own. If they find something substantial, they're gonna be able to keep the whole value of the project to themselves. And we could, we could see the share price uh, you know, shoot up exponentially if they are able to make one of these uh, next-gen type discoveries. Uh, interestingly, you know, as a side note, the company does have 200 million pounds in the ground of what I consider low quality uranium, uh, very low grade, uh, Elliott Lake located in Ontario. Uh, that said, you, you do get a little cherry on top. You do get a little optionality angle to this as well. But for investors coming in right now, I would focus solely on the drilling at Loringer, and we'll just have to see how that goes. Great. Well, Matt, thanks again for taking the trip down here to Belize. It's a good bit out of the way coming from California. I know you're busy running uh, not just the fund, but your technology company as well. Presentation was fantastic, and hopefully if we do this again, we can get you back. Thank you, Colin. It's been a pleasure to be down here, spend the past three or four days with, uh, with the Palisade guys and, and the rest of your network. Um, some really smart investors down here from you know, different, different areas, whether it's real estate or mining, whether it's North America, whether it's the Caribbean, Central America. We have some, some really smart people in the room here. And um, you know, I, I think the timing of this conference was great. Uh, particularly since you made the focus here largely on uranium. When I talked earlier today, I tried to speak a little bit more generally, but we had David Cates down here from Denison, and George Glazier here from Western Uranium. So, you know, I, I think you guys called the bottom at uranium. I think this, this timing is good as far as this conference goes. And, uh, you know, for people listening, if you want to get involved on the, on the uranium train, now's the time to make a move because it can move really quickly. Um, generalists are starting to, to see what's going on but I do not think it's too early to, to rush into the space um, if you find a quality company or two that, that you're willing to, to put some money behind. So um, it's gonna be an exciting, exciting three to four years here. Um, I think there's a lot of money to be made uh, across the space and, uh, and I look forward to doing it alongside you guys. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector junior mining sector are good people and kind people hit the bid how violent that term could be it actually could be quite violent uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally and the world is always going to need raw material it's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth totally destabilized hey hey troll did you hear what's going on in yemen are you too stupid 